Welcome back. I hope you've all got your colour pencils to hand because today I'm going to be talking you through part four of the fluffy cat and we'll be carrying on with filling out the face and moving on to the second ear. Again we'll be using a couple of techniques I showed you in parts one and two including how to use a paper stump, slice tool and how to use tape to remove colour from your drawing. If you missed those videos you can find links for them in the description below and I've included a full materials list there too. So uh, grab your pencils and let's get drawing. So of course with colour pencil it is all about the layering and what I find to be the easiest way but a, a technique that I find works incredibly well particularly with fur is to forget really about any specific details until the last sort of few layers really. Build your layers up, create the texture as we've been doing in the previous videos um, and your tonal values but create those as the initial layers, build them up, and then as you come to the latter layers, you can start to kind of bring in a little bit more detail. And that's kind of what we're doing um, in between the cat's eyes here um, and onto the nose. So we've kind of built those layers up. We've got some really nice soft colors built up there. We've got the texture, we've got the tonal qualities, and then we can start to bring in some of those lovely fur details into there. This works particularly well with paper like pastel mat. If you've used pastel mat before and you've tried to get details in early on, you'll find some, well, the majority of the times it's quite tricky because you're battling with the tooth of the paper so much. So you're trying to get nice little fine lines in and it's just not working and that can be incredibly frustrating. Um, and a lot of the time I think artists will look at um, those who use pastel mat on a regular basis and think how on earth are you doing that? Um, and it's all down to the fact that the colour blocking and the tonal values have all been added beforehand, which have created these lovely initial layers that you can then go in later on and start to add the details into. Um, you know, and that this particular piece is all about that. It's all about adding all of those lovely layers to begin with and then starting to pick out the, the details later on and using different tools to kind of help. We've got the paper stump in there. We've got the, uh, the putty eraser and I'm using, you know, different brands of paint pencils in there as well to help. So the, the luminance pencils are incredibly useful for fur like this because they're soft, they're very subtle colors and they just work beautifully. I also find I tend to go back over areas um, when you're working like I do. So you sort of like I work in sections, but I like to see the whole piece. So I don't use grids or anything like that. And I kind of tend to I have a very basic outline, but I, I tend to sort of freehand um, you know most of the most of the areas because you can't once you get an, a layer down you can't see the outline anyway so it, it's all to do with sort of like eye and everything and um i tend to go backwards and forwards quite a bit just to get the tonal qualities right so if you put an area in say you put like an eye in or something like that and then you um you go and you put some fur around it very often you'll end up going back into the eye because you've then got the context around it of the fur and you'll find that you need to kind of either darken up or add colors or something like that so be prepared to kind of go backwards and forwards a little bit in your pieces just sort of add little bits as you're progressing um you know because you can find that areas aren't nearly as dark as what you thought they were and that's particularly true with pale coloured animals grey horses grey dogs cats like this that are, are very pale coloured you see them as being very pale but actually the dark areas are really quite dark so you start off with a, a, a tone um, and very very often you have to go back again and really darken it up as you realise that you haven't gone nearly as dark enough and that's a very common thing to do Pressure is uh, vitally important, I feel, with coloured pencil. Not the pressure to get it right, <laughs> but the pressure of your uh, pencil on the paper. And this is a really, really good example, actually, of what I'm doing here, of very, very light pressure. I'm using quite a dark pencil. I think this is a sepia 50% illuminance, one of my favourite pencils. Um, and starting incredibly lightly but being able to be dexterous enough to be able to change your pressure as you're moving across so an exercise that i um quite like to give when i'm teaching is to hold your pencil keep your pencil on the paper at all times don't lift it up but 
start to really change your pressure up so you can have light pressure, medium pressure, dark pressure, back to light pressure, back to light, medium pressure, and really start to feel that you've got total and utter control of your pencil. Um, and that way, you know, when you're drawing, you can really, really create some fantastic little tonal differences uh, just by changing the pressure in your pencil you know you can use the same pencil throughout and you can create some fabulous um tonal changes just by literally changing your pressure uh, and it's 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 amazing actually how pressure changes um you know from person to person so my light pressure may not be on anybody's radar at all i tend to use a very 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 light pressure when i first start my pieces um i'm working on a piece at the moment and i don't think i've put i think everything's been light pressure and i've kind of almost finished part of it um you know i haven't used hard pressure at all and you can use your pencils in a way you know a, it, it's tricky because sometimes you'll put the, the, the pencil down and it looks really grainy and you think, well, if I go over with harder pressure, then it's going to squash the grain into the, you know, the pencil into the tooth, going to get rid of some of the grain. And, and actually, a lot of the time, it doesn't work that way and you end up with it looking even more grainier. It's more about which pencils you use um, to kind of counteract that graininess and kind of build the layers. Um, you know, and choosing your pencils wisely is another really, really great tip for creating lovely, smooth, sort of fluffy, fluffy fur. Um, using those lighter pencils in over the top of your darker ones are going to help to blend and smooth, particularly on pastel mat. Um, and there are certain pencils that are, do really, really well for this. The, the Pablos are, are a great pencil for helping to smooth and, uh, and blend. The Granite Rose is a really good one, particularly on a, on a piece like this, where you can kind of bring a little bit of that pinkiness in. The, the Polychromos Warm Grey, two polychromos cold grays one and two again really great pencils for helping to sort of blend and smooth and all of the luminance percent colors and the buff titanium um, the luminance are lovely wax soft pencils so they are always going to do a better job of sort of like um, blending and smoothing any of the layers underneath anyway um, when you're using pastel matte board so this is pastel matte board that i'm using here um, you have to be quite careful uh, because you can end up smearing the colour. Um, I can't remember whether I mentioned this before but if you use really hard pressure um, quite early on you can end up smearing the colour rather than it than blending and it can look a little bit odd. So you've got to be quite careful. So we're on to the second ear here um, and again you know, just sort of plotting those, the shapes in there, the general colours, bringing a little bit of the texture in. It's not I wouldn't call this detail that I'm putting in here. I'm just kind of bringing in tonal differences, a little bit of the texture of the hair and the shaping of the, um, you know, those those shapes in the ear. So you can kind of get those lights and those darks and everything. Now, I'm going to use a, um, a slightly different technique on this one to the other ear that I did. And I'm going to actually use, I think I use the slice tool a little bit more in this one, um, you know, to sort of get uh, almost like an indenting method so that you're sort of working in over the top of those hairs. I like to get a little bit of a frame for if I'm doing eyes, ears, that type of thing, work on the outside, uh, you know, rather than sort of like just jumping straight in on the inside bit. The inside bit is obviously much more interesting to draw because it's got all of the the details and the shapes and all of that type of thing but um, the outside is incredibly important because that's going to be the the general shape of your ear or your eye or you know your nose or whatever it is that you're drawing so making sure that that's all correct and working properly and the right size and the right shape and the right angle right perspective everything like that is really really important so again um the same as i did the first ear starting to plot those shapes so bringing in very soft colors to begin with I find it much easier to work up to the darks. Um, I keep on saying that, but I, I, I do. Um, it means that if something goes wrong, you can easily cover over the top of it rather than going straight in with your darks. Um, really looking beyond the details. So looking at what's kind of behind those fine white hairs and sort of working from the inside out, if that makes sense. I find, again, that works really, really well for me. 
because I don't have to be drawing like tiny little thin white lines or anything like that right from the beginning. I can just build it up gradually. Um, and as I bring pencil marks in, as I use the slice tool, the, uh, oh, as if by magic the slice tool arrives, um, you know, I, I can I can then create shapes that I can then use my pencils to go in between the shapes and create the shadows, and then it starts to look really realistic. Now, I use the slice tool um, a lot more on this ear. I think the first ear, it was a bit of a... Um, it worked really well and I was really happy with it, but it was a bit of a struggle to sort of, and it took an awful long time just to sort of get all of those, the, the stray hairs and everything like that in. So on this ear, I've built the base. I've then used the slice tool quite extensively to create all of those finer white hairs and use them, use the slice tool almost like I would use um, an indenting tool or something like that on the smoother paper so that you, you've got these kind of grooves in the paper that the pencil doesn't, want to sort of sit in if you see what I mean it kind of skips over um and uh, it works really really well for things like this where you've got a lot of fine white hair now I wouldn't recommend using the slice for say creating all of the fur on, on a cat like this and using it to kind of bring all of the fur detail in because if you do that you end up losing the softness so you, you've still got to use your pencils as the main sort of you know crux of your drawing but the slice tool is incredibly useful for something like this where you have got these quite um not harsh lines but they're much more sharp lines you know that they're, they're actual sort of single hairs kind of crossing the cat's ear and it's it's much easier to use the slice tool and make it look realistic on something like this um using it extensively you can see i'm kind of turning it twisting it this slice tool that i'm using here is the manual pen cutter and it's my favourite one. It's got um, a chisel shaped rounded blend uh, blade, um, which means that I can kind of use it in different at uh, different angles and I can take a little tiny bit of hair off or I can take quite a large piece of uh, pigment out. And it's more of a scraping um, technique rather than a cutting. So you're just gently lifting and scraping the pigment off and it works really, really, really well. There are, are all sorts of different um, types of slice tool. I'll use a, another one a little bit later on, a smaller one, but the, the, the manual pen cutter is definitely my favourite to use and it works very well. Um, so get all of those little fine hairs in. You might need to come in a few few times and then you go back in with your pencils to uh, start to pick out some of the shadows in there, some of the definition, um, soften out. Quite often you'll put your slice tool in and it'll look quite harsh. So softening it either with a putty eraser or like the Museum Aquarelle White there, just softening it a little bit with that so that you're still getting something that looks really realistic um, but you're using a tool that's going to really help you kind of lift out those um, those lines but we don't want it to look like you've you've used a uh, you know a knife to cut it out they still want to look like hairs um, and then it's back you know back to just sort of layering uh, creating the depth the, the depth is really, really important. When you look at a piece like this and you look at, um, you know, the cat's ear or whatever, you want to believe that the hair is coming out and over and sitting over the cat's ear. You want it to look like you could, you know, the ear could twitch. That's that's what you, you're kind of aiming for. Well, that's what I'm aiming for anyway. Um, you know, so in that respect, the depth is really important. So... Um, making sure that your darks are dark enough but kind of what I'm doing here now is because I've got all of those little lines that I've put in all those little slice lines it means that I can come in now and start to build these little shadows and really make the hair look like it's sitting over the top and it's all about the shading so everything is all about the shading you know your your how you kind of create those shadows how you sort of uh, blend them how you uh, you know sort of if you've got a light piece of hair how's that going to sit against a darker piece of hair Are you, is it going to be sort of like light dark or is there going to be a little bit of uh, blending in there a bit of shading in there um you know and that is incredibly important when it comes to realism getting your shading correct and it goes hand in hand obviously with the tonal values this stage can take quite a long time. I mean, obviously, this is this is speeded up, um, you know, but you could spend, I don't know, two, three hours uh, more on an ear like this, um, you know, just just building it up. And uh, 
you know, you might not want to spend that amount of time. You know, you might want to sort of you, you not go for as much realism as this. But if you do want realism, then understanding that, you know, every single part of a portrait is important. What happens is we tend to think of the eyes as being the most important part and then everything else sort of like, you know, we can just whack it in and it doesn't really work like this. Um, the, so this is the precision cutter, the slice precision cutter that I'm just using here. Um, it's not my favourite slice tool. It's got its place. It's a tiny, 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 I think it's a two millimetre, maybe not even that blade. Um, very sharp. Um, quite useful in this case for those sort of like tiny hairs up at the top there. Uh, it's just another another little tool really. I started off with a precision cutter when I first started using Slice and then um, I bought the um, the auto pen cutter, the one with the green button uh, by mistake and then um, I, and I was like oh gosh I'm not sure I can do anything with this because it was a really big blade and then I was like oh no this is amazing so that's that's how and then I bought a, a manual pen cutter and that's kind of the one that I use the most now um, but um, yeah they, they've all got their uses but you can see now we're really starting to kind of pick out those details if you'd have tried to put these details in from the beginning you, I think you'd have been very, very frustrated. I know a lot of people do kind of draw that way. But for me, it's much easier to get all of the base layers in first and then work the details in on the top. Um, no matter what paper I'm using, this is the technique that I'll use. Get those, um, you know, the colour blocking and the tonal uh, uh, values in first and then go in with the details. Um, so that has worked really quite nicely, actually. And then we come back down onto the face, um, you know, again, just starting to colour block those soft colours. Um, we're going to start on the whiskers in a second, actually. And, and earlier in the video, you will probably have seen I put whiskers in with the white polychromos and they worked OK, but they didn't work brilliantly. I have to say whiskers are a little bit of um, they're a bit of an, my nemesis, really. I. And I think a lot of people find whiskers quite challenging and it's kind of working out what is the best technique for you, for, for drawing whiskers. Um, and I, I find indenting is a very, very good way of drawing whiskers. Using the white polychromos like I've done on this one is quite a good idea because the white polychromos is a bit of a resist. So it doesn't really like uh, colours going down on the top of it. So if you use the a sharp white polychromos to indent and resist, then that's quite a good combination. And that was my intention on this piece, but it didn't actually work as well as I'd hoped it would. Um, but you know that's okay. You kind of just have to muddle through, don't you? When you get to a point in this in a, in a portrait, this sort of stage, you don't want to start again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so you just have to kind of muddle through. Um, but um, cats I find particularly tricky. Uh, I, and I think it's because you can't really see their bone structure. But, um, you know, the whisker, the whisker holes, all of that type of thing, I do find quite difficult. You can see here I'm starting to come around the whiskers. Um, another one of my big, I don't know, not, not issue well maybe it is an issue I don't know um, I, I need to be a little bit neater sometimes and and take a little bit more care even though I do I do take care and I do draw I don't draw you know I don't rush things but um, you know particularly with whiskers I need to be a little bit neater but you can see here that they, they are working okay they're not working so badly but I I, I can't remember in the video I think I, I suggested that maybe using the indenting method would have been better or pressing harder at least uh, you know you've got to keep a really really sharp pencil for those so I think an embossing tool would have probably been a better bet um, uh, but then you know we just come down onto the whiskers and just start filling them in. You want to be really, really careful with cats around this sort of area that your first strokes are correct. And one of the biggest challenges I find when you've already got the whiskers in, um, what happens is, and if you can see the whiskers, what happens is when you come to then put the hair in around the whiskers, sort of like on the, the cat's sort of cheeks there, your tendency is to go in the same direction of, as the whiskers. Um, and sometimes that's fine because the whiskers are going in the correct direction for the fur. And sometimes it's not fine because the whiskers are going in completely the opposite direction. It's it's like it's like 
patting your tummy and rubbing your head. <laughs> it, it's it's kind of a normal, natural thing just to kind of go with the flow and, and off you go. Oh, yeah, everything's in this direction. So you've got to have your wits about you, I think, and be really, really careful that you end up with the, you know, the cat fur going in the right direction. Um, that's something that I, yeah, I... I find quite a challenge, I have to say, and and very often we get carried away and we're like, yep, la la la, off we go, um, in with the um, in with the whiskers, in with the cat fur, and then it's like, oh, I've done my fur in the wrong direction. So um, my suggestion would be something like this: is to use indenting method is really good. Make sure you use quite a thick um, tool for indenting. Don't use don't think you know that a, a tiny weeny pinpoint um embossing tool is going to be better than a thicker one because actually it's quite easy to kind of drop your pencil in there um with the thinner ones and it all covers up so um you know using using an embossing tool like the one i'm using here on the um on the tape actually is a good idea it's got a bit it's got a rounder end on the other side of it um and and obviously the tape works incredibly well as well just to kind of bring out some of those little areas but take your time um you know get the color in nice and softly i like sort of like a, a more soft and subtle approach to sort of something being you know quite quite heavy handed but it, that's up to you and, and your style and everything um but um yeah whiskers whiskers oh my goodness they um they always get the better of me do whiskers <laughs> I don't know why. I think, you know, even if I have to draw black ones in, I'm like, I get really scared. Um, you know, so I think with whiskers, plan them. Um, be, be quite methodical about planning them and make sure that you have kind of thought through whether you put them down first or whether you put them down at the end. How are you going to put the whiskers in? Are you going to try and draw them with a white pencil if you're using abrasive paper? Are you going to indent them? Or are you going to use something like, um, you know, the, the, the products that are out there, the pearl burnish, the brush and pencil, um, you know, uh, titanium white, something like that. It's entirely up to you, but plan them. Hi everyone, thanks for watching this video and I really hope you found it useful and have learnt something new. If you have any questions or queries, please feel free to leave me a comment and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If you want to see more videos like this, hit the subscribe button below and if you'd like to find more tutorials filmed in real time with loads of detail and full step-by-step -step instructions, you can join my Patreon for just £5 a month. You can find a link for this in the description below. Hope to see you again soon.